be continuing in Romans 1, but if you want to read us a verse out of 1 Corinthians 3, and tie in last week's message. 1 Corinthians 3, 3, here Paul says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You recall from last week, we talked about those who caused divisions, those who were envious and covetous. And right. All those things are a sign of carnality. Exactly. Yeah. Even the Corinthians struggled with those things, so we don't need to think that we are above them. Amen. So, going back to Romans 1, we'll continue here. I didn't notice something I hadn't noticed before when I was studying again. It kind of gives three different uh, groups here in our text. The first, he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. And there's a semicolon that separates the next group that are full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. And there's another semicolon which begins our thought today, which is whispers and backbiters, haters of God, disobedient, proud, boasters, and inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without natural. Or two with without understanding, coaches breakers, without natural affection, placable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Amen. Verse 29 through 32. So we'll pick up here today at Whispers and go through verse 30, Lord willing. So here he begins with whispers. Whispers are someone who who slanders secretly of gossipers is really what they are. Mm -hmm. You know, backbiters is next, but it's very similar, but not exactly the same thing. We'll turn back to Proverbs and look at two, two scriptures about whisperers or gossipers. I don't know what it is, but Christians seem to have this, a bad habit of this one. Right. It's the nature of flesh that would like to spread rumors and yeah. anything that sounds kind of juicy, we like to talk about, don't we? Right. Mm -hmm. but those things never bring about any edifying to the saints and more glory to God. You're bad. Proverbs 16, verse 28. To the a forward man so with strife, and a whisperer separated chief friends. You bet. This whisperer, this gossiper, this uh, causes problems even among the best friends. I'm sure you've all seen how rumors spread easily, how rumors often change from maybe a little bit of truth to just outright falsehood. Mm -hmm. If you ever played that game called Telephone, you know the story gets changed a little bit each time. Right. Well, these things never bring about anything good, and yet we should have nothing to do with them as the people of God. We turn over to chapter 26 of Proverbs. Verse number 20 and verse number 22. He says, where no wood is, there the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bear, that's a whisper or a gossiper that the strife sees it. Amen. We all know about burning wood. If you don't have any wood, the fire is going to go out. Right. That seems pretty obvious, but yet he says the same is true with the, with the tail bearer, the gossiper. The gossiper, they, if they're not there, there's going to be no strife, he says. This person causes strife, causes divisions, causes trouble, if you will. Mm -hmm. Verse 22 says, the wounds of a tail bearer are as, the words of a tail bearer are as wounds. They go down to the innermost parts of the belly. Mm -hmm. and they cause these lasting wounds, these scars. And we say, <coughs> as kids, you know, sticks and stones might break my bones, the words will never hurt me, but words do cause a lot of harm to whether it's to emotions, whether it's to reputations, whether it's to our own testimonies. It matter. But this gossip, as it calls here, is tail-bearing, is to the causes wounds that 
don't just easily go away. Mm -hmm. Even after they may have been maybe gone, yet these wounds linger on, he says. Right. And why did I have on my middle finger here? I have a scar when I was 16 years old and a pocket knife folded up on my finger. Mm -hmm. That was 15 years ago, yet the scar is still there. Right. That's exactly how these this tail bearing does. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the event may be long forgotten about, but the, the aftermath still remembered. Amen. Yet whispers, or gossipers, tail bearers, whichever term you want to use, are all synonymous. They should, we should have nothing to do with that as a people of God. Mm -hmm. It's a mark, instead of carnality, of, of the corrupt nature that is within man. You know, he doesn't, man doesn't necessarily like to talk about the good someone's doing, but, let's, but we sure do like to talk about the latest juicy details, don't we? Right. Amen. Verse 30, back in our text, backbiter goes along the same type of lines. A backbiter is one who talks about someone else behind their back, especially if they're friendly to them to their face. But it's not necessarily in, in secret like the gospel or the whisper is. Well, did you hear what <coughs> so and so did? Or, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be like it. I would consider Brother Larry my friend if I went, if he went home and told Don, do you see what Brother Derek was wearing today? Or do you see, hear what he said? Or, or if he went over to Brother Junior's house and said, do you know what Derek's been up to? That's, Right, look back at her, dude. Hey, man, you're right. Pretend to be your friend and then talk bad about you behind your back. And yet, so it is with mankind, isn't it? That they'll be your best friend to your face and then talk about you when you're not around. Right. Well, I seem in this saying it's supposed to be a, a funny one, but there's actually some truth to it. It says, don't talk about yourself when you're here, we'll do enough of it when you're gone. <laughs> Let's go over to Psalms for a moment, Psalms 15. We can see God does not bless this type of actions. Psalm 15, verse number one. We'll go ahead and read through verse three. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, Notice verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. He's described here the type of people who have the, breast, the presence and blessings of God. Amen. And one of the characteristics is one who backbiteth not. Mm -hmm. We should never be called of us that we are a backbiter, that we are <laughs> one who talks about people behind their back. We go over to 2 Corinthians, though we see they had a little bit of a problem with this. 2 right. Corinthians chapter 12. Even though they, the second letter to the Corinthians was much less scathing than the first letter. The, Paul still has concerns, as he points out here. In verse number 20 of 2 Corinthians 12. He says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall find or, and that I shall be found unto you such as would not, lest there be debates, envies, wraths, strifes, backbites, whispering, swelling, tumults, and lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Amen. Paul was con concerned that even though the Corinthians had improved, that when he came to them, he would find that they were full of these things. Mm -hmm. His debates, we talked about that last week, and envy and wraths and strikes, but then he mentioned backbitings and whisperings and so on. We ought to not think that we're not capable of these things. Amen. The Corinthians had a problem with it. We could very easily as well. Yet none of those are becoming of a Christian. None of those things, once again, 
They neither edify the saints nor glorify God. Right. Let's go back to our text and we'll continue on here in Romans. After backbiters, he says, haters of God. <coughs> That's those who both hate God and are hateful towards God. Amen. We turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Here we see the Ten Commandments of God. Gives an example of those who hate Him. Exodus 20, verse number 4 and 5. And because of the command against idolatry. He says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon uh, of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Amen. There he likens idolatry and being a hater of God. And certainly if we are committing idolatry, we are not loving God as we ought to. Mm -hmm. but I think he he's saying that we were essentially hating God when we right. commit idolatry. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, you know, a physical golden calf like the Israelites had or anything that we make an idol certainly turns our love away from God. Amen. We turn over to Psalm chapter 81. There's several warnings against those who hate God in Scripture, but this one in particular we looked at recently with this. Psalm 81 and verse number 15 it says, The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. Amen. He's saying here they should submit to God. We have Instead of their time of judgment, it's going to last forever. For all those who hate God, all those who are the haters of the Lord, as he says here. And certainly we live in a very godless and God-hating society today, but their time will come and God will Amen. pour out his wrath and pour out judgment upon them, and that shall last for all of eternity. That should be a, a humbling thought for any who are not saved, but yet bad. If those who hate God are so full of their hatred towards Him that they care less about what He has to say. Mm. If you recall in Revelation, they'll go as far as to curse God. Try it. Because the natural man does not love God by nature, rather, he, he hates God. He said so he hates the idea of God, and we saw he tries to stamp him out, even any remembrance of him in his knowledge. You can be sure those who hate God will one day face judgment before him, will one day stand before him and have to give an account before him. Right. As to this flesh, just as it may be, they will say, he will say to them, depart from me, workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Right. And cast them into the lake of fire, which burneth with brimstone, day and night, forever and ever. And yet God will get the glory out of even that. Amen. Let's go back to our, go back to our text here and continue on. You go from haters of God to despiteful. That's, that's an insult or that's one who verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. You don't just mean that they're getting your feelings hurt, but they tear you down, defame you, if you will, both mentally, emotionally, they, we live in a very uh, sensitive day, don't we? People right. are easily offended or easily have their feelings hurt, but that's not what this is talking about here. This is going farther than that, and to the point of insulting your character and your being, and <laughs> just completely tearing a person down. Right. Yet, if you follow social media much, you'll see that men do this all the time. Mm -hmm. and it can be a complete stranger on the internet, yet they'll com completely tear them down, their character and everything else, without even knowing the person. And yet, right. So it is within the heart of man to 
I don't know if it makes them feel better about themselves, probably, but... Yeah, we are told in Luke 28, we are to pray for those who despitefully use us. It's never for the child of God to tear them down and defame them. Right. The Westboro Baptist churches, they call themselves, they, they're good about doing it, aren't they? They like to rail at people, and, mm-hmm. and certainly sometimes they have a little bit of truth in their message. But you, it's never for the Christian to have that hateful attitude toward them. Amen. You're right. We're told, instead, we're told to pray for those, we're told to bless them, we're told to share the gospel with them, to love our enemies. So to be one who is despiteful is not, should never be named among the ch- children of God. Amen. Then he goes on from despiteful to say proud. That's the hoggy, that's those who think and act as if they're better than others. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to do, isn't it? And I see even our type of Baptists sometimes are, get a bit proud because you know, they're a good, sovereign grace Baptists. Right. But we ought to remember that it's by the grace of God I am what I am. There you go. Amen. So, no, you can't truly believe in the grace and goodness of God and be proud about it. Amen. Because grace will humble you. Grace will show you that you are unworthy. Mm-hmm. That you didn't deserve any goodness from God, and yet He was pleased to bestow it upon you anyway. But the proud say, Look at me, and look at how good I am. Mm-hmm. We'll turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse number 6. It says, But he, speaking of God, giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Amen. God has no pleasure in the proud. In fact, it says, it says here he resists the proud, but, he, but rather he gives grace unto the humble. Those who truly see themselves for who they are, that's who he gives grace to. Amen. But you know, Paul, he was very proud in his old self, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yet it took God smiting him almost literally on the road to Damascus and giving him blindness to bring him down to show him that he wasn't all that he thought he was. We turn back to Proverbs 16. Even in salvation, there's no room for pride, is there? Amen. You're right. That kind of goes along with our next point. But Proverbs 16, verse 5. To everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Amen. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. See, so we have a Another issue with pride is sometimes we might not boast about ourselves necessarily, but within our hearts we're very proud, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we can put on outward appearance of humility, but yet God is no more pleased if we have pride in our heart. Mm-hmm. You know, if, only, if we say, oh yeah, that's that's no big deal, nothing. And then within ourselves we're thinking, oh yeah, look at what I have done. Mm-hmm. We can pull man, but God knows if we are truly proud of in heart. Yeah. Next, next point back in Romans is it goes along with pride and it's boasters. Mm-hmm. That's those who like to brag about themselves. Amen. Especially those who like to do it in excess of the truth and like to embellish their stories a little bit. Right. People do that a lot on their resumes for work. <laughs> Hikers, even professional writers will help you do it. <laughs> <coughs> Yet we have no room for boasting as the people of God. Amen. That's right. 
But the natural man, he likes to boast. He likes to be proud of himself. And he likes to bring out all the good details and make himself look even better than he really is. Mm -hmm. We can turn back to James again. James chapter 3 and also in verse chapter 4 we'll look at a couple verses here. James 3 verse 5 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. Behold how great a matter of little fire kindleth. Our tongue can get us into trouble, can't it? Amen. That's right. Our tongue will it'll tell all about how good we are, what we've done, and what we've accomplished. Yet we were told previously that he should bridle his tongue. We should. Yet here he says it's a it's a fire. Verse six: of the fire of world iniquity. So it is a tongue among our members that defiles the whole body, and set on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Get that? Just a little a little member. He calls it just a little piece of the body. Yet it can defile the whole body. It can be used to. Corrupt our entire being to really to destroy our old testimony and character, right? But it's good about telling how good the flesh is. Yeah. Go on to chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, we see another type of boasting. Probably somewhat familiar scriptures here, but it says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we will we shall live and do this or that. Amen. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Amen. A man likes to boast about his, what he's going to do with it, doesn't mean If we're not careful, we can do the same thing. I mean, that tomorrow I'm going to do this, or in 30 <coughs> years I'm going to retire my lake house, or whatever it may be. But yet, if we truly realize our place and God's place, and we would, we would say, like verse 15, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Amen. And even just the next day or even the next breath is the gift of God. We have no room for boasting about what we're going to do. Really any more than we have to boast about what we have done. Amen. Like I said, even in salvation, it's for by grace are you saved through faith and not yourselves. It's the gift of God. <laughs> this is not a work, so that any man should boast. Amen. If man has room to boast, he will boast about it. Amen. The natural man will say, look at me, look what I have done. But yet, the true understanding of grace will show us that we have done nothing in and of ourselves. <coughs> really, there is no good within us. Amen. There really was no, nothing deserving of salvation or any blessings of God. Amen. Man or many professing Christians present grace as just something you have to take or you have to accept. Like that's not what real grace is. You're right. The true grace of God is even more than we were undeserving. We were completely deserving of the opposite. And yet Amen. God was gracious to us. Let's turn to Isaiah and we'll look at one more place on this point. Isaiah chapter number 10. Verse number 15. And we will get to boast even more again later in the book of Romans. But here it says, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the soul magnify itself again against him that shaketh it? As if the rock should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself, as if it were no wood. Mm -hmm. He's saying that in all these different tools, boast or do anything of themselves. Right. And so we are as a tool when God is as a workman. 
That really all, we, all that we can do is only by God using this. Well, I have, if you have a shovel on your shed, you never use it. It's not doing much anything, is it? Right. But if you take it up and start digging a hole with it, then it's useful. But you wouldn't say, well, this, this pair of shovels like a fine hole, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, that's exactly how man thinks. Man has the shovel, and we, yeah, man thinks that he dug the hole all by himself. And even the littlest of accomplishments we have are only because God, if I could say it aloud, it. Amen. He said, we are a tool useless without God putting us to work. Amen. So there is really no room for boasting as the child of God, or really any human being, but especially as the people of God. Let's go back to our text and look at these last two points, and we'll close. After boasters, he says, inventors of evil things. And that's one who comes up and develops evil. It doesn't necessarily have to be material objects. You know, that's one, one way you can be an inventor of evil things, but also those who come up with evil ideas and evil ways, they are an inventor of evil things. And we have a lot of that today, don't we? Mm -hmm. We have physical devices that are used for evil. We have a lot of ideas and teachings that are used for evil. A lot of man has developed even more ways to be wicked. You know, we should not be surprised, though, when the natural man seeks to do more and more evil. There's really nothing new under the sun, according to Ecclesiastes, but right. man always tries to think of new, new ways to commit the same wickedness. Mm -hmm. we go back to Psalms. <laughs> Psalms chapter 37, again. Verse number seven here it says, Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We should not worry about those who develop and use wicked things. Right. These inventors of wickedness are these, as he calls them here, those who bring wicked devices to pass. We don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 12, verse 2 tells us that God will bring them into condemnation. Mm -hmm. so man can come up with all his wicked ideas and wicked objects and all his evil things that he wants to, but yet none of them will ever be able to triumph against God. Amen. None of them will ever be able to thwart his purpose and plan. My note. Satan is very cunning and very crafty. And he <coughs> is always showing man, I guess you could say, new ways to commit wickedness and new things to do it with. But yet, we know even Satan himself is under the hand of God. Amen. So yes, man's going to invent his wicked devices, his evil things, but yet, in the end, we know how it's all going to melt with the fervent heat. It's all going to be done away with. Amen. But we should not, we have no reason to, to worry over those things. I think one of the most literal examples we have of that in scriptures is Haman in the book of Esther. Mm -hmm. we, we'll turn there and read just two verses, but you know the story of Haman, he made those gallows to we come against Mordecai and all the Jews. And eventually he was hung upon him himself. Right? So, I'm skipping over the book of Esther here. Sticking together there. Uh, okay. 
Esther in chapter number 9, verses 24 and 25, give us the end of the story. It says, Because Haman, the son of Hamadeth of the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and cast per that is locked to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he had devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, Amen. and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Haman was an inventor of evil things, mm -hmm. yet it came back to bite him in the end. If God got the victory, and so we will in this world, even though man admits his wickedness and it seems to prevail more and more, that in the end we know God will get the victory. God will yeah. bring judgment upon the wicked just as he did to him. Let's go back to Romans one last time here, Romans 1 verse 30. After inventors of evil things, we see disobedient to parents. Right. Well, this is breaking the, the fifth commandment. It says 20 verse 12, to honor thy father and thy mother. <laughs> there is a, a promise given there if we do honor them. Exodus 20 verse 12 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy day, days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Amen. Now, certainly there's more to it than just obeying parents, but being disobedient is the first way we dishonor our parents. Amen. In fact, we, some might say, well, that was the Old Testament. <coughs> that promise isn't any more, but Paul quotes it again in Ephesians chapter 6. Amen. Turn there and see this, Ephesians 6, the first three verses. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Amen. We don't see that very much today, though, do we? Mm -hmm. All you got to do is go to the grocery store, or especially Walmart or somewhere, and you can see lots of <laughs> disobedient children. You're right. I know it's in the nature of man to, to be rebellious, to be disobedient. Yet, as parents, it's our, also our job to discipline. You know, you know, to not spare the rod and spoil the child, as the scripture says. Mm -hmm. but he says this is right, that we should that children should obey their parents. As I know Brother Larry's point out, it doesn't say children obey your Christian parents or your godly parents. Because unless they're leading you away from God or to break his commands, we are to obey our parents as children. Mm -hmm. Going on verse 2, he says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. We'll say, this was the first commandment given, he says, that has a promise with this. Mm -hmm. Verse 3 tells us the promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Well, I don't know if that means he's going to extend our days or prosper our days, but either which way there is this promise that comes with honoring our parents. Mm -hmm. Yet we see we live in a day of much disobedience, don't we? Amen. It begins with disobedient parents, and then it goes on to you know, school and work, and yep, eventually Amen. the law and governments. But there's no no respect for authority, and disobedience just continues everywhere. But yet we, our society, says we can't. Can't spank them, you know, put them in time out or something like that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we shouldn't advocate for abusing our children, but it didn't take me didn't take very many spankings for me to learn I didn't want to do that again. Right. Amen. Disobedience to parents is a, once again a mark of the corrupt nature that is in man. The disobedience the disobedience continues on though, except to the workplace and the law. But we, as a people of God, are told to obey those in authority. Amen. Unless they are commanding us to disobey God and His law, we are to be in obedience. Amen. 
certainly when they come to that point when we are told to write the commands of God, we should say like Peter and John, we ought to obey God rather than them. Mm -hmm. But until that point, we are given to obey those in authority. But we are first and foremost our parents, but so continuing on to every aspect of life. Amen. We see even Christ was obedient to his parents. And some might say, well, what about that instance when he was 12 years old? But he wasn't disobedient to them. He didn't dishonor them. He just he was simply doing his father's business, he said. Amen. And certainly he obeyed them once they caught back up with them. No, we'll go ahead and close there for the day, and we'll, go and we'll look at the last two verses next week. And Paul can finishes up his list here of characteristics of the corrupt nature of man. Mm -hmm.